So I'm Jonas Kjellberg. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the game changing. Um, I hope we can get the second slide up there as well. Um, so um, the last couple of years I've been working with the Kinevik Group. Um, they own Tele2 here, but I've been responsible for their online acquisitions. And um, I've done the investments into Salando, challenging you know, the um, apparel industry. Uh, I did the in investment into the Rocket Internet guys, the Samuel brothers, basically trying to disrupt uh, the VC US world. Um, I was uh, the chairman of the board for iCloud that we sold to Apple. Uh, I've been, um, I was the founder of uh, Player.io, sold to Yahoo a couple of months ago. Um, and I'm going to tell you a bit more about my story. Um, and what I believe is the disruptiveness. I think people call it you know, the troublemakers. I will call it game changers, because I think that's a much nicer and, and fun word. Um, so that's basically the story. If this been a normal lecture, uh, I'll be doing this for about 30 minutes, and you're listening. Uh, let's turn this around. Uh, the challenge is because I'm often wrong. And what I say doesn't always comply to everybody's thinking. So tell me I'm wrong. Let's get a discussion going here. Because your knowledge about game changing, running businesses, beyond my imagination can take that to a new level. So see, let's do that. But let's start with this. Is it the fast that beat the slow? Or is it the big that beat the small? Fast that beat the slow? Uh, hands up. The big that beat the small? Hmm? It's a 50-50. It's not, a, it's not, a, it's not a, you know, a, a unanimous vote here, because I think it, what it actually does is also changes over time. So let's move on. What is it that defines a game changer? I think for me, it's about creating a new market or disrupting existing ones. Basically, are you mad enough of going after those big guys? And how do you actually do that? That has been my passion for nearly all the years that I've been working, trying to understand how can you do things better, how can you do things different, but are you willing to change the game? Because there's a lot of people there talking about innovation, how important it is, but they're not really willing to change the game and really take that risk of stepping outside and saying, I don't give a shit about the US VCs and all my friends there, because I'm going to do it in a different way with some guys from Germany. Right? Wrong? I don't know. In the end, it will prove if the 400 million euros investment into Zalando is success or not, because success is never defined. But let's take you through my, my other passion. My other passion has been also, during this period of time, I've been writing three books. Uh, with a Harvard and Stanford professor. And I, I met Tom and Leah and I a couple of years ago when I worked back at Skype, and I had the vision of writing a book, a 100-page book, and half of it had to be pictures. And they said, you know, you're mad. You know, that's not the dream I want to have. That's not what I want to do as an as a author and academic. But I said, well, there are thousands of millions of entrepreneurs out there, and we need to do something accessible. So let me give it a shot. So I did it my way, together with them. Then I went back to the publishers, the existing industry, and I said, I got this great book. It's 100 pages. It has the best authors in them, Clayton Christensen, Red and Blue Ocean. We got it all in here. They literally laughed, or even gave, didn't call me back, because they said, you know, a book has to be 500 pages with one theory. We can't have one book with 50 theories on 100 pages and a lot of pictures. So sorry, we can't help you. Well, I said, screw it. I'll, give, I'll start my own publishing house. How can difficult can it be? <laughs> then, the next part, I said, let's launch a new book. But let's only have pictures. No wording at all. Called business creation. How do you create the business? And then, magically, out of nowhere, applies Wiley, one of the most prestigious publishing houses, and says, we would be very happy to publish your book, Jonas. Why? I would say there's only one reason. 
it's selling. And they want to be part of it. So now we're launching this in the US in a couple of days, actually, and it's already out there in the UK. But my, my compassion has been around the framework that I developed together with Tom and Lena, and, and the, the framework actually started at Harvard. And, it's, um, and when we started, I said, okay, what do we call the book? And I said, let's call the book Sales. And they said, yo, Jonas, you're doing a lot of stuff, but let's not call it sales, you know. <laughs> because that sales doesn't have a good word in academia. Okay, so what do we call it? Uh, it's a customer acquisition-centric strategy. <laughs> Why? We needed the word strategy, because otherwise we would never get published in the Harvard Business Review. And that was very important for my co-authors. But one of the things when we developed this is that this is the framework they're using in Silicon Valley. And the interesting part here is that customer acquisition is in the center. Why? If you're crazy enough to want to change the world, I tell you, you need to sell to everyone your idea, your passion, why you're going to change the world. And it's much harder if you have something that no one believes you will succeed. So when, if you go back to a lot of entrepreneurs that I've worked with, in the end, it's all about adding customers. Even if it's a religion, even if it's politics, in the end, it's about getting people to buy your idea. And this is basically how I started my, my career. I had the opportunity to actually start working for Kinevik very early on, after I just finished to graduate. I started as the CEO assistant. And as the CEO assistant, you cook coffee, you re-park cars, you do a shitload of PowerPoints, then we bought a couple of companies and we listed two. And what still is tradition in Kinevik, as the CEO assistant, you become the CEO for one of the subsidiaries. And that felt very natural, you know, I had a double degree and I spent a whole year with top management. So for me, becoming a CEO was totally natural. So, when you're a new CEO, what's the first thing you do? Anyone? What do we learn in school? Strategy, of course. It's interesting. Do you know how many books there are at Stockholm School of Economics when it comes to sales? Give me, how many books do you think there is about sales? Four. How many do you think there are in strategy? Thousand. And the interesting thing with all the strategy books, I often say, they always end. Add more, add more revenue, add more customers. And this is where it really hit me that I, you know, shit, I did double degree, so I missed a lot of the economic sections. So basically, in panic, had to go back and see what did they teach me about sales, because I must have missed those lectures. So I went back and started flipping in my textbooks, and this model comes. Must be a shit more important model, because it was nearly in all textbooks. What model is this? The BCG growth share matrix. And it's great, you could be a store up there, you could be a cash cow, this company was not making money at all. So left for me here was the dog. And what do you do with the dog in this model? You shoot it, divest, kill the dog. Brilliant model for a new young CEO, huh? So, I went back to eight acres, SWOT model. How many have done a SWOT model here? Great, let's put in Jonas Hjelberg here 15 years ago, what comes out? A lot of weaknesses, huh? <laughs> a lot of weaknesses. Very few strengths. Okay. I knew nothing about sales. So when, if you're a CEO and you don't know anything about running a business, what do you do? Anyone? Hire one, of course, I know that now, you know, distance yourself from the problem. <laughs> Get someone else in that you could fire later on, eh? I was still young and naive at this point of time, so I thought, I need to learn sales. What do you think you get for advice? 
Well, the advice I got was that I needed an agency. We needed a marketing plan. We couldn't start selling things without doing branding activities. There are a lot of marketing professors, very few sales professors. So I got the really good advice. The advice I got was I needed three million euros before we could actually start selling. So very simple, I had to go back to the board, Jan Steinbeck, famous entrepreneur in Sweden, and ask for the money. Next board meeting, I only have two points on the agenda. One, I need a new billing system. Two, I need the three million euros. So it starts out quite good, you know, chit-chatting uh, about, you know, weather and thing, and then how's business? Oh, it's okay, we're starting to tell. So what's your first point on the agenda? Uh, I need a new billing system. And I can see the guy just going, oh, no, and he basically throws his pen on, on the table and he literally screams at me, you idiot, why do you need a new billing system? You have no customers. At that point in time, I basically, you know, I decided to get rid of the second point. <laughs> and then I said with my young enthusiasm, well, I'll be back with a lot of customers. <laughs> and then I left. You know, <laughs> with a lot of depth for going through graduation, you know, it was a bit early to retire at this point in time. So what do you do? Well, it ended up, I called my father, and he gave me a brochure that said, 100 knack, 10 knack, 1 tack, from a framgångsrik Electrolux försäljare. Basically said, 100 knock on the doors, 10 talks, 1 thank you, from a vacuum clean sales guy. And this was actually the first time I came in contact with what is defined as a pipeline model. And whatever you do, and I think I'm still amazed, is about trying to understand how can you increase customers? Because no customers, no fun. And for me, being an engineer, this is all frequency. It's quite simple. If you do 200, you sell more. <laughs> it's math. It's brilliant. It's not complicated at all. But most companies, they just go like this. But for me, it was, how can we increase frequency to the max? And I'm still amazed about the companies when I'm sitting in boards, they say, we're going to grow 10% this year. And I said, why not grow 1,000? It can't be done. Of course it can be done. But the challenge is, they don't know what kind of activities drives their customer acquisition. So they can't increase it. So if you want to be successful, you need to be very, very analytic and engineering about what drives customer acquisition. Because in the end, it's what converts that generates cash. We can talk about game changer and visions and ideas, but if it doesn't generate customers, it ain't going to be worth anything. Trust me. Go to the VCs and ask later. But I've learned that the hard way as well. So, sales. And, and I come from the Nordics, you know, so I did the army up in, in north, and we have, you know, a saying that says, et skott, et treff. But the US guys, they were approaching this totally different, you know, they just fired at everything. <laughs> and it worked. During a period of time, I had over a thousand employees sitting in a call center. I got them every morning to get up on their chairs and say, this is going to be the best day of my life, <laughs> before they sat down and did customer acquisition. Do you think it worked? Of course it worked. So I was super happy they were teaching strategy at the university, because for me, I slept with this 100 knack tea, snack attack under my pillow. And I went on, I started a couple of companies, you know, we listed one, we sold one to Vodafone. Life was good. Then I moved on to become the CEO of Lycos. Anyone remember Lycos? It was a search engine, the second largest search engine in the world. 
Do you know what happened basically the first day I started? Two stupid engineers started in a garage in Palo Alto. <laughs> Google. And now if you're the executive directory for a big company like Bertelsmann, what do you do at this point? You laugh at them, huh? How can they challenge, you know, a big Bertelsmann media company? They're so far away. And when they don't go away, what do we do then? We try to ignore them, huh? They don't even have a business model. <laughs> they talked about always delighting the user. This was totally new for me. For me, everything had been always, always delight the shareholder, me. They said content was king. Then I said, no, 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 sales is King Kong, and I just pushed the throttles in my customer acquisition engine. But even how hard I tried with all my mechanism for customer acquisition, I brutally failed. They did something that was different. They did something which was called delight. They delighted the user. So what is delight? We've taken this from the unique selling proposition. Uh, it's uh, the hierarchy of customer needs. How many know Maslow's hierarchies of needs? Basically, it works the same way. You know, at the top, you have the delight, but to be efficient, you need efficiency and functionality. And it's, it's, you, know, you, you can compare it with a car. Anybody driving Alfa Romeo here? Wow, perfect. You know, you know the delight of that car, isn't it? It has beautiful design. So it has a great delight. The problem if the car doesn't go from A to B, the delight falls. Some Alfa Romeo owners, they often say, you know, that you get a very personal relationship with your mechanic, but I doesn't say that that really counts. So it's all about trying to understand what is your delight? What are you communicating? What do the customers say to each other? Let's take an example. This car had a great delight. What was it? Safety. What's Volvo's delight today? Oh, wow, 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 wow. Do you think they sold more cars before than they do today? Yes, they did. Maybe now the Chinese will change it. But the challenge with this is that they innovated when it came to their delight. They added a lot of safety features. But what do you think happens with you know, safety, when you add your 24th airbag for your knees and all cars are rated five star in an end cap. It goes from being a delight down to a functionality. So the challenge here is trying to innovate beyond for all companies because it's so easy that we spend all a lot of time on efficiency functionality. But what is the clear delight up here? I often ask, you know, CEOs, what's your delight? And I often get a very blurred question. You know? And then you ask others that really know what they're doing, you get it that, like that. This is what we're doing. Oh, sorry. So, um, another company that had a challenge, of course, was Harley Davidson. And they had a very big problem because the Japanese were basically eating up them. So what do you do if you're a CEO for a for a Japanese comp or for a US company, when you get competition, well, you call your state senate and say this is not okay. <laughs> and they imposed a, a tax of 10%. But basically, the company went into chapter 11. So they had to go away and try to find what is their delight. And what they, what they came across at that point of time was what we sell is the ability for a 43 year old accountant to dress in black leather, ride through small towns, and have people be afraid of him. <laughs> and this is our innovation intent. And they totally changed the game when it came to flying, or to flying, to, to, to motorbiking, because they actually didn't take it from A to B, they took it beyond. So the lesson here is innovate, don't imitate. This is a really, really tough model to do. So it's about creating that friction-free storytelling that is super important. 
But going beyond, I started with frequency, which is one of the gears. Second thing, you really need to understand your delight. It's not about selling something, it's also about taking something beyond. Because what did Google do? Against Lycos, they actually did a better product. And if you're a sales guy, that's not fair. But if you have a great product that disrupts the world, and you put a lot of sales to it, it's great. But we're lacking one thing, the business model. Hmm. I've tried this hard, you know, if you're not generating cash over time, it's going to be tough. Your brother sell it to someone big early on, but in the end, we need to make money. That's basically the game. So, how can you work with your business models? I had the opportunity of basically joining Skype at a very, very early time period. You know, we were about five people in the Stockholm office. And, of course, I came with the background of being customer acquisition, but I've learned the hard way that we needed a clear delight. And what is the ultimate delight for calling? I'd worked at Tele2, you know, we could have the price, but if you really want to be true to delight, I said, then we should have the delight to zero. The price should be zero. Puts a lot of constraints into the business. So we started the zero game. Of course, we could call everybody, but that would be too expensive. So we said, okay, we need to find a much more effective way of doing this than anybody else. If you have a telco, and then you had Skype, at this point in time, the telcos, they were building infrastructure. The PC, or the internet, a lot of people had just got broadband. So we said, okay, let's use the existing internet that customers already paid for. And we innovated in our first zero. Second thing, you need an XC switch to actually transmit and send the call. The CPU power in the personal computer was the same as for Ericsson. We said, okay, so let's code the calls in the computer and have them sent. And again, we had a zero in cost. Now comes the challenge. You have to route this traffic around the world. So you need a lot of voice over IP gateways. How many here use Skype? Oh, everyone, great. And how many have come back after a session, your computer is very, very hot and the fan is running in max. Well, if that's the case, your computer has become a super node. And all traffic is routed through your computer. And in that way, created another zero. Because we realized there were a lot of computers connected to the internet, but not being used. So we said, with the software you install, we can actually use them. I don't know if I've gone to your professors here at Trondheim and said, you know, is this okay, 2005? We'd like to send this through everybody's computer without asking. You probably say, no, you're mad. But well, we believe so strongly that the delight was more important, so we were willing to take the risk. Second part was customer service. I ran two telcos or three telcos, and I knew this was about 30% of the cost. My problem was often I was more pissed after talking to customer service than before. So I said, let's make it impossible <laughs> to call Skype. No phone number on the website, no phone number on business cards. Let's make it impossible to call us. Don't like it, uninstall. And we were actually one of the first, actually, where if you press this button, everything disappeared. Don't like it, leave. There's the door. And in that way, we took out another cost. And what we have come through is that many of the most successful companies have innovated in zeros. Give me an example of customers that have been or companies that have been good in innovating in zeros. 
Anyone? Amazon. Amazon. What have they done? Yeah. So they've actually innovated in, in the way of actually connecting buyers and sellers in a very, very good way. I think the most innovative way is their marketplace at this point of time, where they're actually just having people buy and sell and actually making money on, on the transmission or transactions. Other companies? eBay. eBay. Well, they're doing the same thing. Airbnb. Airbnb, you know, same model again, but connecting buyers and sellers, beautiful model. What about this company? Is there any delight <laughs> of flying with this company? <laughs> yeah? My wallet is delighted. Your wallet is, they're cheap, huh? But they have taken it beyond. They've not just innovated in zeros, they've actually innovated in revenue, huh? Before it was free to bring your luggage, they started charging for it. They started charging for coffee. Do they call the national airport and say this is cheap or you know, we want a better price for landing at your airport? No, they don't. They call it a smaller airport and say you pay us and we'll land there. And the government is off, no, that's not how it works. Mm, that's how it works. So please give us three million euros or we won't land here. <laughs> oh, that should be a plane, but... Um, so the perspective here is trying to redefine the existing business models. Do you think their staff gets paid? Are you sh oh, you're a bit uncertain, huh? <laughs> <laughs> if you go to SAS, they pay for your education. Do you think Ryanair pays for your education? Of course not. And after you've been trained, you need, you know, to get your license certificate as a pilot. How many hours do you need before you can get your... Any pilots in here? 4,000 hours. And during that period of time, Ryanair is so nice that they actually hand out their aircraft for free. So only one pilot getting paid. Why? Ryanair says, we're a bus company. If you can drive buses with one pilot, why can't you ride airplanes with one pilot? They've even taken it so far that to apply for Ryanair today will cost you 40 euros to send in your application. And you're all smart business leaders. What can you do then? Rationalize them. Huh? Take down costs for, for HR. But the second thing, do you think applications have become better or worse? Applications have gone down, huh? Applications have gone up. Or oh, uh, the quality has gone up. So now, HR is a profit center for Ryanair. Take that back to your companies and say, let's see if we can make you know, HR into a profit center. But these are basically the perspective of trying to understand how can you drive change and innovation because it's in every gear. It's in you know, what you deliver to your customer, how you innovate in sales, getting a clear delight, innovating in your business model, and this goes on with partners, going global, and so on and so on. They all interact, trying to find the right team. But that was basically a very, very short perspective of my own little story and what actually drives game changers and people that are willing to change the world. It's about taking the risk and stepping outside, you know, that little box. My, um, my former colleague at Lycos, he once said, you know, when I said, we have to have some out-of-the-box thinking here, Felix. He said, Jonas, there is a reason we have the box. Because you should be inside the box and not outside the box. <laughs> and look what happened. Huh? <laughs> Thank you very much. That was all for me.